Our first lesson comes from the book of Acts, starting with the 34th verse of the 10th chapter. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, now, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. And our gospel lesson comes from the third chapter of Matthew, starting with the 13th verse. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water at that moment. Heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a lightning on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please be seated. I love doing this at chapel. You know, we have a chapel we do here every Wednesday morning. Sometimes it's with all the little kids, sometimes combined. But we do what are called repeat after me kind of prayers. So this isn't going to be a prayer, but repeat after me anyway. I am a child of God. All right. Now we're going to say it like we mean it. Because it's exciting. I am a child of God. Awesome. Grace, peace, and love to you from Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. I know a pastor who never uses an umbrella, all right? Maybe you have a friend like that. He doesn't mind getting wet now and again because he says that the rain reminds him of a fundamental truth, that he's been baptized. He probably would have used one at six this morning when that torrential downpour came through, maybe you noticed, but, but he understands that when he walks out there and gets wet, it reminds him of his baptism. He's been washed clean, forgiven, adopted, renewed, filled with the Holy Spirit, and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Right? How many of us have been baptized? You too have been washed clean, forgiven, adopted, renewed, filled with the Holy Spirit, and marked with the cross of Christ forever. This is baptism we're talking about today. It's phenomenal. As Martin Luther states, he says, there is no greater jewel around, right? Water is a very important piece of this. Water has always been around. In the very first verse of the chapter, the first book of Genesis, we hear about the creation, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Once that happened, things began to take shape. Water was one of those things. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Water has been a part of creation really from the beginning, it's played a major role in all of God's people from that time on. Um, in school, of course, we learned that it's, it composes or covers about 75% of the earth, making it the most abundant resource that we have, which is sad given the lack of water that's avail not available to many folks throughout this world. But because water was created by God, it has a purpose 
and it has a power. Water is not just water. Because it was created out of the nothingness formed by the word of God. God spoke, came into existence. So water is not just water because it was formed by God through God's word. And that makes it pretty important. And so on this day that we celebrate the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ, we remember that water was also part of this crucial day, and part of this baptism event, and it still holds a very fine value for us as well. So we're going to walk quickly through what baptism is and what it isn't. First, what baptism isn't. It is not a get out of hell free card. Just not. Sorry. <laughs> it is not going to get us to heaven just by getting us baptized. Right? So why do it? Well, here's how we talk about it as Christian Lutherans. Our baptism is an outward expression of our faith. It is a means of grace, grace that is bestowed upon us, means of the wonderful grace that has been given to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Baptism dare not be despised or willfully neglected since it is explicitly commanded by God and has its precious promises attached to it. Right? It's not a mere ritual or a symbol, but a powerful means of grace by which God grants us through faith the forgiveness of sins. Right? So that is baptism, as we talk about it theologically in our Lutheran circles. But that's the tricky part, right? Being baptized is an outward expression of our faith, and it frees us from sin and death. But what baptism is not is stagnant. It is not still. And I'm going to use the same umbrella from earlier as an example, right? Um, although my pastor friend doesn't use an umbrella, an umbrella is a useful tool to keep us dry. But just by owning an umbrella, just by having an umbrella, doesn't help us if it's pouring down rain, right? What do you have to do with it? Open it. You have to use it. And that works for our faith, that works for our discipleship, and that works for our baptism. This is how we approach baptism. We have to use it in order to truly unlock the means of grace that God gives to us through it. Right? We use it to influence our lives because we have been made clean. And we use that gift as a way to bless others as well. So what baptism isn't is something to be kept inside and hidden away from others. Right? Now, what baptism is, is one of our two sacraments here in our church. I'm going to briefly run through what those are as well. We have the sacrament of Holy Communion, which we'll partake shortly, and then we have the sacrament of baptism. Our sacraments have a threefold meaning. We take them very seriously as they're ways that God directly communicates with us and conveys those means of grace that we talked about. All right? So our sacramental threefold meaning is this. A, number one, they're commanded by God. Sacraments are commanded by Jesus. Right? We baptize because he commanded us to do so. It's that great commission, Matthew 28, 19. Go, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? The second part to a sacrament is they have an earthly element attached to it. With Holy Communion, we have the grapes and the grain, the bread and the wine. For baptism, water. All right? And thirdly, sacraments carry with them that promise, those means of grace, the promise of forgiveness of sin, the promise of the Holy Spirit ever present in our lives. All right? Sacraments in our tradition are very crucial to Christianity and how we believe. But what else is baptism? It's an identity. Baptism holds an identity in Jesus Christ for us. For the earlier followers of Jesus, first century or so, baptism was first and foremost a way to identify who you were, personally and publicly. Baptism meant you were a follower of Christ. You were a follower of the way a Christian is when we started coining the term at that point. Following in the footsteps and the teachings of Jesus Christ, gathering together in his name. All right. It would take place, this baptism then, a uh, way to become a Christ follower would be through baptism. Uh, it would be a public ritual, much like ours is these days. But the key that once they became baptized, they then lost their previous identity. All right. They were now identified as a Christian. If they were Jewish or Roman, whatever it was, whatever gods they believed in, all those, they had to renounce those in many ways that we renounce evil. All right. Because that would now involve them in a new community as part of that. And they assumed that new identity. Right. 
So being baptized in the waters of life granted them that new identity, and they lived out that identity with the worldview and the values that were part of being Christian. Right? Their former worldviews were renounced, and in many ways that would actually put the newly baptized at odds with their families, and in many ways the community. In the earlier days, there was no doubt if you were a Christian, because you looked different, you followed different rules, you treated people differently, right? It looked different than the rest of the world looks. And in many cases, it would cost them all that they had, including their lives. Now, we don't lose our lives for being a Christian today, not in our country anyway. There are those who are still losing their lives. But the question still remains for us. If we knew we would lose all that we had, would we still be Christians? Right? Uh, there's an awesome story about a missionary that was sent to Africa. She went there. She was traveling to and from, looking for a place to talk to, to folks. Well, she happened upon a small baptismal service. It was another fellow missionary who was there who had just taken three converts now to the center of a shallow river. They dug a hole so there'd be enough water for them to, to be immersed in for the water for baptism. And so a few friends and family members had also gathered to watch. And the missionary in the river raised his hand, repeated familiar scriptures along with that, and, and then dunked the new converts in. Well, the first convert came up out of the water and was just screaming ecstatically, excited, joyful, all, all just overwhelming joy. And that quiet service suddenly took on a new appearance. Right? The second convert did the same, dunked, came up screaming with joy, was excited about it. And the third as well did the same thing. So afterwards, the missionary asked about this usual tradition. She said, why is there so much shouting? Why so much joy? Well, he said, I haven't fully been able to translate and understand uh, the communicate in the tribe's language. So they heard the scripture that I gave them, but they didn't quite understand the symbolic nature of it. I used Romans 6, 4, and the passage reads, we are buried with him through baptism into death and raised to walk in the newness of life. So they thought baptism would actually kill them. <laughs> so when they came up from the water, they were extremely happy to still be alive. Right? And so they laughed, of course, at this misinterpretation. But until the visiting missionary froze and she said, well, wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. If you thought baptism would kill you, would you still be willing to get into the river? All right? Followers of Christ... Do we believe in our baptism that strongly? Do we value our baptisms as one of the biggest things that has a claim on us? Do we claim it? Because through it, God claims us. And we get to say, I am a child of God. Right? Well, my friends, I'm here to tell you today that our baptisms, unfortunately, have been truly, truly watered down. Two of you. All right. Thanks, Greg. All right. That's it. Okay. What that means, <laughs> we've lost the primary focus for what baptism does for us, right? Um, if you were here last year, you've had a conversation with me over the, the last year and a half or so. You'd know that I value my baptism date pretty importantly, November 27th. It's just as important as my birth date, probably more important than my birth date because that's when my life truly began. Not as important as my wedding date, but nonetheless, it is still truly important in my new life with Jesus Christ, right? But do people know that we are baptized? Do people know that we're followers of Jesus Christ? Can they tell that our lives are different because of it? Right? Because the point of our baptism is to be changed, to be cleansed, to be adopted. Everything changes with our baptisms. And our baptism is a call to serve as well. It's a call to bring others to that river, to the life-saving waters of Jesus Christ. It's a call to openly admit that we are sinners, we always have been sinners, and we always will be sinners. And just dipping a toe in the water is not enough. It's a matter that, of others seeing that our baptism has changed us, truly changed us from who we were to who we are now. And because of that change, we have to live differently than the rest of the world. We have to commit to being followers of Christ. We have no problem committing to our jobs or our kids, families, a lot of other things. What is keeping us back from committing to Jesus Christ? Committing to growing in our faith, to growing in our discipleship, to growing in our service toward others in the name of that same Jesus. 
What is keeping us back? Jesus Christ freely gave of himself, freely gave of his life, committed to us to go to the cross. And we get baptized and we do this out of response to that gift that was given to us. We respond by wanting to know him more deeply, to grow in that relationship, that love that he gave us, and to reach out to others so that they too can experience the life-changing event that happens to us, right? By the fact that we are baptized. Um, Maybe there a year ago or so, there was a conversation that went viral. Maybe your kids or your grandkids were engaged in this debate like my kids and their friends were. And the question was this, is water wet? Right? Some of you might have seen that as the title. I thought it would be kind of a fun thing to do. Well, my big kids will argue with you that, in fact, water is not wet. Right? Water is simply water. The wetness of water only applies when it reacts with something else, and that's what makes it wet. Right? But there, are, of course, are others who like to say that water, by its nature of being water, is wet because it cannot exist without being wet. This is the level of conversation that happens in my house. (laughs) Right? So what do you do? You go to science. You try and find a scientific way to figure this up. So the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, has a couple answers. First, they say being a liquid, of course, water itself is not wet, but can make other solid materials wet. Wetness is the ability of a liquid to adhere to the surface of a solid. So when we say something is wet, we mean that the liquid is sticking to the surface of the original material. Right? That's what makes it wet. Again, we just have to define what wet means. So if we define wet then as a sensation that we get when liquid comes in contact with us, then yet, yes, water is wet to us. I'm not really going to dig into this, right? <laughs> Be like, let's go. Um, But you don't have a Ravens game to go to, so it's all right. All right. Oh, sorry. Too soon? Too too soon? All right. We're going to have confession afterwards. All right. (laughs) I was going to say that was the Holy Spirit, but that may not have been. All right. So, if anything, it's going to clear. Let's, Let's just use this wet example as anything as a way to really kind of look at how water works. Somebody got really mad and they walked out. All right. But because this is an important earthly element in our baptism debate, we get to use this as as a way, as a perfect analogy when talking about our own baptism. All right. Is water wet is a great example that we can use. Using what we know about being wet, right, about how it affects other things. When we get out of the pool or out of the shower, there is no way someone won't notice that we're wet. Water always sticks to us, and it's obvious that we are wet, right? Changes our hair, changes our appearance. We use the terms dripping wet. You can tell something is different based on that water. Um, Our son Theo is taking swim lessons. When he gets out of the pool, you can tell he is wet. Trunks are wet. Hair is wet. It has a different appearance, right? We look differently. So allow this analogy of baptism and getting wet to inform this conversation we're having today. Can people tell if we are wet through the baptism, right? And maybe they can tell that we're wet in some ways, but have we gotten everything in our life wet, completely wet, fully immersed? There is something right now that every one of us is carrying around that we don't want God to control because we want to try and control it. That's what we're talking about, right? What is it that we're not allowing God to control in our lives that's going to get wet if we turn it over to him, right? Maybe it's our job. Maybe it's our finances, relationship, family, whatever it is. What are we trying to hang on to control with, right? It has to get wet. And we aren't talking just a sprinkle here or there. It needs to be dunked and drowned in those life-saving waters of Jesus Christ. It has to be covered and changed, not by science, but by our total submission to Jesus Christ. Because then and only then, will we see the results that God has for us. Only then will things change. And we all have something that needs to get wet. But if we, do, if we do nothing with our baptism and it just sits there, if our baptism just sits with us, then water is just water. Baptism is just baptism. Until it's thrown then onto a situation and it makes things wet. That's when things change. And we are called to make the world wet. 
We do that by allowing our baptism to influence our lives, to move us flowing toward people, not away from them. Uh, Baptism pushes us towards other people. It's not only salvific for us, but it makes our lives so much easier to live because it frees us from having to judge people for who they aren't and allows us to accept them for who they are because we were accepted for who we were at our own baptism. See, we're all children of God, and therefore through our baptisms, we're all called to see others as children of God, to reach out to them, to love them, to proclaim the gospel to them. And because our baptism has radically changed us into those children of God, we have to make our baptism a priority. What baptism is, it is the great leveler, meaning it levels the playing field for all of us. All of us throughout the whole world who have been baptized now have one thing in common. We are all children of God. We're all made in the image of God for the glory of God. Each and every one of us. Right? That makes us all equal in God's eyes, which also makes it easier to look across the aisle or in the pew or in the eyes of another and see God in that person. Think about how much easier that is to love and accept someone knowing that they are a child of God. Maybe we'll leave today. We'll see someone that doesn't look in the best hygiene or look, scares us or they look like they've lived a hard life. Maybe they're the epitome of vulgar. We all have one friend like that, right? But through our baptism, we get to see in them the face of Christ. Think how about how much easier it is than to reach out to them where they are. Not where we want them to be, but where they are. And offer that hope of Christ so that perhaps they too then can experience that radical changing that we have in our own lives. Because our baptism calls us to respond. It calls us to serve. We use our baptism as a starting point. We can use today as a starting point. Uh, We're going to have a time after the prayers to reflect on our own baptism. Yes, we'll invite those little ones or any, actually anyone who's been baptized this year. I don't care if you're little or small or big. If you've been baptized this year, we want to celebrate. So we'll invite you up. We'll light a candle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're going to commit and we're going to reaffirm all of our baptisms. And we're going to do it in light of going deeper in our own relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're not baptized yet, we don't want to leave you out. Come and see us. We'll take care of that pretty easily. All right? But as a way for us to remember what our baptism is for, we're going to get wet. All right? We have baptismal fonts placed in the aisles here. All right? When you come forward to receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dip your hand, dip your finger, put your hand in there, whatever. Just know there's others behind you. Feel the wetness that it gives us. Right? Feel that it is wet. Imagine our baptism being wet, affecting our lives. Let it cover you. Imagine how the blood of Jesus Christ is covering us as well. Let it get you wet. right? And then take it with you as you walk toward communion. To know that you are forgiven and free. Whatever it is that's holding you back, whatever you're keeping from him, that, give, give it to him. That's the time. We all have something. Because it gives us freedom. We are free to live a life in Jesus Christ. We're free to commit, to surrender to the one who surrendered his life for us. We're free to receive life everlasting with no attachments. We're free to respond by sharing that love and faith with others through witness and service. My friends, one of my constant prayers for you all is that you embrace your baptisms. Allow it to guide your lives so that you will truly make an impact in the lives of others. So others can see how truly wet we really can be. How different we really are because of Jesus Christ. And we will have plenty of opportunities to put our faith into action this year. We just heard about Stephen Ministers. I'd encourage you, in some way, shape, or form, to be active in that ministry. As we walk together in this new lay-led kind of way that we're, we're walking with one another. It's a perfect opportunity. It gives you some basic training. But it's a way to become Christ to others. A way to respond and to serve them. But at a start, let's embrace our baptism. This is the day we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. And it's the day we celebrate our own baptism. The day we remember we all got wet. And because we're wet, we have to call and go show others why being wet matters. Water has a purpose and a power. And our baptism has a purpose and a power. 
a power that saves us from sin and death, allowing us to respond with that same grace and mercy that was given to us. A power that allows us to see each other as equals in light of our own baptism, remembering that Jesus came to save us all on that cross. And a power that puts Jesus Christ first in our life, taking us deeper into that life-saving relationship with him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. I invite you to stand. God, thank you for sending us your son, Jesus. As he was baptized in the Jordan, we too have been baptized through him, into his life, into his death, and ultimately into the resurrection that we all get to celebrate by that. Help us to live through our baptisms each and every day, to help get others wet, to share what we know, and to truly live free. This we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, thanks for checking us out. Thanks for watching. Trinity is a discipleship-driven worship community. We'd love for you to come and be a part of this community as we uh, celebrate who Jesus Christ is in our lives. Uh, check us out on our website, trinityjapa.org. Uh, please go there, or we have plenty of social media outlets you can check us out as well on. Uh, if you'd like to physically come and see us, we'd love that as well. And uh, we have services on Sundays at 9 o'clock is our traditional service. We have a contemporary service at 11 o'clock. And we're really in, in looking forward to our second Saturday celebration service. It's the second Saturday of the month at 5 o'clock where we'll come together and, and worship. But plenty of outlets, plenty of ways to reach one another to connect with one another, and we'd invite you to do so with us. Love to have you. So in the meantime, go in peace. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks.